Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, folks on Zoom. <laughs> Grateful to have you all here with us today, folks in person and folks in our Zoom audience. I'm Joanna Lalikas. I'm the Director of Education here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. And we're so glad to have you join this lunchbox talk with us where we'll have Chris go forth share about dragonfly behavior. I'd like to thank our fall 2022 lunchbox talk event host at the long leaf level is Tom Keenan and the funds that are brought in through this event host opportunity help us with prog prog excuse me with program planning accessibility and with the reach of these programs. So we are grateful for Tom Keenan's gift. Chris Goforth is the head of citizen science at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and works to get the general public involved in scientific research. We've been grateful for a long time partnership with the museum in multiple ways. So it's great to have, it's really an honor to have Chris share her passion for, with us here in person at the garden. She holds a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in entomology. And when she's not teaching about citizen science, she can often then be found poking around streams looking for aquatic insects or studying dragonflies at ponds. And I just learned doing some ceramics work. So that's exciting. And so this, I understand, is one of her favorite talk topics to talk about. So grateful to have her here to share her passion. Chris, thanks for being here. All right, welcome everyone on Zoom. And uh, welcome everyone that's in the room here with us. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, so um, as you heard, uh, I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, we're based in Raleigh. I'm sure most of you have been there, but if not, you know, we are a free museum uh, and uh, are the state natural history museum. Uh, and my job uh, is to really help people connect with scientific research opportunities that they have as members of the public. Uh, so whether you have experience in science or not, citizen science projects are ones where you can um, actually participate in, in science and in authentic science. Uh, but I do have my background in entomology. Uh, I've published papers on dragonflies. I have two citizen science projects that I run currently that uh, are focused on dragonflies. Uh, and these are my absolute favorite insects, have been for a long time, and I'm super excited to hopefully get you excited about them as well. So we are gonna be focusing a little bit more heavily on behaviors today than uh, I would usually do, but uh, I do wanna give you a little bit of background about what dragonflies are and some of their kind of life history so that um, the behavioral information will make a little bit more sense. Uh, so the first thing I wanna talk about is what a um, dragonfly actually is. So um, the Odonata is the order of insects that both dragonflies and damselflies belong to. Um, they are the toothed insects. Uh, Odonata means toothed insects. Um, they are uh, characterized by their, their mouth parts uh, really in this group. Um, although for separating out the dragonflies and damselflies, you're looking at other characteristics, but dragonflies have some really pretty powerful mouth parts that give them their name. So um, as far as body characteristics for these animals, um, both the dragonflies and the damselflies share a characteristic. They have uh, large eyes. They have really big, broad, flat wings. Um, you can see this uh, green darner here, you know, the huge, huge wings on these guys. Uh, they have a long, skinny abdomen. They have um, four or six legs not four legs, uh, six legs that are bunched up in the front. Uh, and we'll talk about what they do with those in a little bit. Uh, and they have really short antennae. One of my biggest pet peeves actually is how people who um, do dragonfly art will put these big long butterfly antennae on them and it just drives me absolutely bonkers. Um, their antennae are really short. I mean, can you even see their antennae on this guy? They're there, they're little tiny bristles next to their eyes. Um, but dragonflies and damselflies share all these characteristics. And then there's a few behavioral characteristics as well. Um, they are really superb flyers, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, they are voracious predators, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, they have really interesting mating practices, so we are gonna be talking about that today. Um, and hopefully you're gonna hear some really cool behaviors. Uh, so within the dragonflies, we've got them split or within Odonata, we've got them split between the dragonflies and the damselflies. Uh, and there's some characteristics you can use to kind of tell the two apart. So for dragonflies, they tend to have kind of a thicker, more robust body than the damselflies do. 
their eyes are really huge and wrap around most of their head. So they actually either touch or there's a really little narrow gap between their eyes um, on both sides of their head on the top. So their eyes are huge. They can see almost every direction around their bodies all at once. Uh, their forewings and their high wings are different sizes and shapes. And this is what entomologists use to tell the dragonflies and the damselflies apart. Um, the dragonflies are actually in the suborder Anisoptera, which means different wing. And so that front wing is a little bit more narrow than the hind wing, which has kind of this extra little section here that's tacked on. Uh, so different wings in the front and the back. And then these guys are holding their wings out to the sides at rest most of the time. So if you're just looking at a dragonfly or a damselfly, this is the one that most people are using to tell the two apart just at a glance. Um, they're almost always gonna be holding their wings out to the side. Then for our damselflies, they are very similar in a lot of ways, but they tend to have skinnier bodies. So they're really, really, really skinny compared to their length. Um, their eyes are very widely separated on their head. So I like to think of it as kind of, you know, if you cut a ball in half and kind of stuck it on either side of their head, that's kind of what their eyes look like. They're very spherical, like hemispheres um, on either side, and there's a big gap in between them. Uh, here's the one that entomologists use. Their forewings and their high wings are almost exactly the same size and shape. So when they're holding all four of them together over their backs, which is what these guys do at rest, it kind of looks almost like they just have one wing uh, because they're holding them so closely together and they're all almost exactly the same size and shape. So damselflies belong to the suborder Zygoptera, which means same wing. Um, but again, most people are gonna look at the, how the wings are held at rest, um, usually up over their backs. The wings might be on kind of either side of their body, but they're gonna definitely be like up over the abdomen, not out to the side. All right, so I always like to do a little quick quiz to see if we can tell these two apart. Um, so people on Zoom, you'll have some polls coming up here in a moment uh, and everyone in the room, I'll just have you um, vote. Um, so take a look at this one. Is this a dragonfly or a damselfly? Uh, if you think it's a dragonfly, please raise your hand. All right, seeing a lot of hands. Most of the polls look like they are coming in as dragonfly as well. All right, and would anyone like to vote for damselfly? All right, we got a couple couple damselflies. Got one, one poll as well that came up with damselfly. So um, this is actually a dragonfly. And you can tell because you've got um, this front wing is a different shape than the back wing. So you've got this whole big extra section here. Uh, those eyes are huge, and you can actually see that kind of line in the middle here. Uh, and it's got kind of that thicker body. Now, this is a really awkward angle to look at a dragonfly from, but those wings held out at the side are a really good indication that you're looking at a dragonfly and not a damselfly. Okay, here's the second one. Dragonfly or damselfly? And this is one of my favorite species that you can find locally. All right, anyone want to vote for dragonfly? All right. Seeing people polls coming up. All right, who wants to vote for damselfly for this one? All right, seeing lots of hands, pretty much unanimous in the room. Looks pretty unanimous on Zoom as well. All right, this one is in fact a damselfly. Um, again, you can kind of look at how they're holding their wings held up over the backs. You're looking at a damselfly. You can see that all four wings are about the same size and shape. And you can definitely see that big gap in between the eyes here and that long, really skinny body. All right, one more. How about this one? Dragonfly or damselfly? All right, in the room, who would like to vote for dragonfly for this one? All right, seeing a lot of hands. Looks like most of our poll people are green on dragonfly as well. All right, anyone wanna go for damselfly in the room? All right, looks like we got maybe one hand over on the side. Okay, so um, this one is a dragonfly. And again, I keep giving you like really awkward angles here with the wings, but holding out at the side, 
really good indication this is a dragonfly. And on this one, you can see how those eyes are actually touching in the middle. So they're not way on the sides with a gap. They're, they're wrapped all the way around and, and touching in the middle. And you've got that big, thick body. This is a female common whitetail, uh, and they have a really extra fat body compared to a lot of dragonflies. Um, really, really super common species in this area. All right, nice job, everyone. Okay, I wanna tell you a little bit about the life cycle of dragonflies, and then we'll jump into the behaviors. Um, so dragonflies have a hem hemimetabolous life cycle, uh, which means that they have a three-step process for their um, their life cycle. This is all, all often called incomplete metamorphosis, um, but hemimetabolism is the fancy word for it, so that's the one I'm going to use. Uh, these guys start off with um, mating, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, and once they have mated and lay eggs, you get uh, nymphs. And so the dragonflies and the damselflies look very different, just like they do as adults. Uh, this is a damselfly nymph. Uh, you can see they are kind of long, skinny bodied, just like the adults, uh, but they have these three big, long gills on the back. Uh, and we'll talk about um, what they do with these in a little bit as well. Um, but long, skinny body and have these three leaf-like gills um, sticking out the back end. Then in our dragonflies, they look um, a lot more robust. So again, the adults are more thick bodied. The, the nymphs are also thicker bodied in the dragonflies than the damselflies. Uh, these guys don't have the, the leaf-like gills. They've got big spikes sticking off the back end. Their gills are actually inside their body, and so they're pumping water in and out of their back end to um, um, flow over their gills that are in a rectal gill chamber. Uh, and so they're, um, they're pumping water in and out of their, their bodies very regularly to get oxygen onto those gills that are tucked inside their body. It's a really cool weird, crazy system. Uh, and dragonflies are really one of the only things that have anything like this. Um, why the damselflies are so completely different and have gills instead is not something I, I can answer, um, but uh, they're, they're very different, very, very easy to tell these two apart. These guys live in water, so they are aquatic um, and they are going to need to transform into terrestrial adults. And so they will have to actually come out of the water to turn into adults. Um, so you have a, a nymph that crawls up some piece of vegetation onto the shore, onto a rock, uh, and then they will basically swallow a whole bunch of air and pump blood around to different parts of their body and then break their exoskeleton open and start pulling their body out. So you can see this dragonfly is starting to kind of pull its head and its thorax out of the, the exoskeleton. They'll eventually kind of fall out and then they'll kind of hold on to the, the plant or whatever substrate they're on. Uh, and you can see that the wings are still all bunched up because they are holding those wings in little wing pads as they develop. Uh, only adult insects have wings. Um, and so they've got these little external wing pads that are not functional for anything, but they hold those wings bunched up. And then they'll start pumping blood into those wings. They'll start swallowing a bunch of air to kind of puff their body up because they're going from this little nymph to a bigger bodied adult. So they have to stretch everything out. And then once they've got kind of everything where it needs to be, their body will harden up. And then at that point, they'll be able to actually fly away and do the kind of normal things that dragonflies and damselflies do. So pretty basic three-step process that a lot of insects have. You have an egg, a nymph, and an adult. Um, but for these guys, they're going from a aquatic immature stage to a terrestrial adult stage. So there's a pretty major transformation that's happening. You know, they have to change their entire respiratory system um, to a different system entirely. Uh, and it's a, it's a really, really big shift. All right, so. That's the background I wanna give you. Now we're gonna jump into some behaviors. I think watching dragonflies do the things they do is one of the most amazing things ever. Uh, and so I hope that you all will agree that some of these things are definitely worth going out looking for. Uh, and I kinda of wanna divide these up into kind of categories. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is flying. So dragonflies are really special for a lot of reasons. They've got a lot of weird anatomical structures that make them very different than other insects. And one of the things that they have going for them are direct wing muscles. 
almost all insects have their wing muscles actually attached to their thorax and not directly to their wings. And so that's called uh, indirect wing muscles. And they're actually deforming their whole thorax to flap their wings, which is a crazy system. And I have no idea why that exists because um, most other animals that fly don't have wing muscles that are attached to their rib cage, for example, and like flapping their wings that way. Um, but dragonflies do have wing muscles that are attached directly to their wings. So they have direct wing muscles and that makes them able to fly really, really, really well. They can control all four wings independently, which means that they can do things like hovering, which is an, a behavior that's actually really, really hard for most insects. Um, there are some flies that can do this and bees can do it a little bit, but some bees can. Um, but it's really, really hard for a lot of insects to actually hover in place and dragonflies do it very well. They can also turn like 180 degrees with almost no effort. They can stop and start very easily. Um, they can fly upside down and backwards. Uh, so they can do a lot of things that some other insects really can't do as well. Um, dragonflies are kind of divided and damselflies into um, perchers and flyers. And that is um, based on the behaviors that they exhibit. So flyers, pretty much fly during all their active hours. So for example, this is a terrible photo because they're really hard to get pictures of, but uh, this is a comet darner. They fly pretty much eight to 10 hours a day. Um, they don't rest very much. Um, they are flying over the water pretty much constantly when they're active. Uh, and so when they go off to roost, they'll actually sit down and, um, and relax for a bit. But during the day, they're mostly, mostly flying and they barely stop. Perchers tend to sit in one place and so they, they definitely have a lot of activity. They're moving around a lot, but they have a place that they sit. And so they'll sit there, they'll go off and do something, and then they'll come back to that spot and sit some more. And then they'll fly out to another place, do something else, and come back to that spot and sit again. So you'll see them coming back to the same place over and over and over again. And these animals are really kind of divided into these kind of two different behavioral categories. Um, those Categories don't necessarily correspond with like their families or anything like that. It's, it's just kind of the behavior of that individual species. Um, but people talk about perchers versus flyers a lot. You have um, dragonflies that fly really long distances uh, when they migrate. So there's at least 23, 25 something species and probably more um, dragonflies in particular that fly or that migrate. Um, this here illustrates one of the longest animal migrations in the world. Uh, this is the wandering glider. It's a species that we have here in North Carolina natively. Um, this one can fly across oceans under its own power. Uh, and it does migrate in the US as well. Um, but this particular migration from India to Africa and back is a really, really long one. It's 11,000 miles. And it is a couple of generations, so it's not you know, the same individual flying all 11,000 miles, but it's, um, it's a really, really long distance. And these guys are flying across oceans to do it. Uh, here in North America, we have kind of a different Eastern and Western population. Um, in the West, we've got a, um, uh, um, oh my gosh, a meadow hawk uh, that is the primary migratory species. And it travels from kind of like uh, Western Canada down into California and then kind of disperses. They're not all going to the same place uh, the way that something like a monarch would. Uh, in the East, we've got um, this wandering glider, but we've also got uh, the common green darner is pretty much our main one, um, you know, really big blue and green dragonfly. And they fly by the millions, if not billions uh, from areas where it's getting cooler to places that are warmer, then they lay eggs and die. We don't know exactly where they go. And then another generation is coming back. Um, this is a big area of research right now. We don't know as much about this behavior yet, um, but there's a lot of people that are really excited about this and trying to learn a lot more. It's a really, really cool thing that these guys can fly for, you know, really days at a time without resting very much. Dragonflies also capture prey while they're flying. So they've got all those, those six legs bunched up near the front. Um, they use that as kind of a scoop to scoop other insects and prey animals out of, the, uh, out of the air. I say prey animals because there have been demonstrated instances of these guys catching and eating hummingbirds, um, but mostly they're eating insects, um, almost exclusively eating insects. 
but they basically just um, hold their their legs in a way that um, allows them to kind of grab the prey, kind of I, I call it a death hug. Um, they grab it, like pull it to their face and start chewing it up. Some dragonflies will eat their food while they're flying and others will land and eat, um, but they are definitely catching their food while they're flying um, pretty much entirely, both dragonflies and damselflies. All right, so speaking of feeding, uh, these guys are predators. They're eating mostly other insects. Uh, and that's true through their whole life stage. So when they are, uh, well, not when they're eggs, but when they're um, nymphs or adults, they're predatory. Uh, the nymphs are running around hunting underwater and the adults are on land. So adults are uh, foraging a good part of their day. That's kind of the main activity that they do. They need to eat a lot to be able to power this amazing flight that they have. Uh, and so you've got your perchers and your flyers doing things a little bit differently. Your flyers are kind of just flying in this kind of rectangular pattern over the water over and over and over again. Uh, and they're just grabbing food wherever they can get it. Uh, sometimes they'll go away from the water to eat. Um, and I'll talk about a behavior where they do that here in a moment. But um, the perchers do things differently. They're gonna be sitting on their, their piece of vegetation. And when they see something fly by, they'll fly out and snag it and then usually come back to their perch and eat it. Uh, and so they're still grabbing things while they're flying um, and they're foraging a little bit differently. Like they're, they're watching the landscape and grabbing things here and there rather than flying around and catching things. Um, but both perchers and flyers are foraging most of the time. So the, the nymphs, are really cool. So I mentioned at the beginning that these guys are called the toothed ones. One of their weird things that they have is this crazy mouth part that fits up under their head. So this would be normally kind of folded up under their their um, their chest and their the bottom of their face. Uh, and this is a um, a little grabbing tool basically. So something swims out in front of them and they fling that thing out. It's got hooks on it. They grab the prey and then they'll pull it back to their face. And then they've got other mouth parts here that they actually use to chew things up. Um, so this mouth part is super weird. Um, there's some muscles that attach uh, up here that help control it and they can move some blood around and things to help control that thing. It's super fast. Um, there's been a gentleman who's been trying to actually um, do this high speed videography on these guys to get that exact moment where it's like grabbing something and he keeps missing it because it's so fast that even his camera really can't get it. Um, but um, it, they're amazing hunters. These nymphs can eat things like tadpoles and small fish and other things. Uh, and they of course eat a lot of insects as well. Um, if you don't like mosquitoes, you should appreciate dragonfly and damselfly nymphs. Uh, they do eat a fair number of those. All right, this is my absolute favorite behavior. And this is actually the subject of one of my um, citizen science projects. Um, dragonflies will form these really big feeding swarms. Um, this time of year is the exact perfect time to actually see these in this area. Um, and they're basically taking advantage of localized abundance of prey animals. So um, this is actually where I work uh, at the, the museum's Prairie Ridge Eco Station. We've got a tall grass prairie. And in the late summer and early fall, we get huge numbers of little gnats and other things that are kind of coming out of the grasses. And these dragonflies form these big swarms over the top of that prey population and basically just pick them off. Uh, so you can have anywhere from, you know, dozens to millions of dragonflies in these swarms. Um, most of the ones that I see are in like the 50 dragonfly range, but there've definitely been ones that have um, been estimated to have you know, like 4 million plus dragonflies in them. Uh, and they're basically just flying around hunting massive numbers of little prey insects. So it's basically an all-you-can-eat buffet for these, these animals. Um, these swarms actually form really readily while they're migrating too. So they'll migrate for you know a day or a day and a half and then they'll rest for a day or two. Uh, and so then they'll take advantage of all these little prey animals um, and um, eat all those little insects and then that'll power their, their next burst of, of flight southward. Another thing that they do is take advantage of large mammals um, with this behavior called accompanying. So this is something that you'll see a lot um, actually forming those swarms um, where someone's walking through a field or people mowing or other things, you know, anything that'll disturb all those little prey insects, 
the dragonflies love that. And so they've learned that they can follow things like people and like water buffalo and hippos and things like that. And um, they'll kick up all these little insects as they move through grasses and then they can follow them and eat all those little, those little animals. Uh, so this accompanying behavior is really pretty cool. Um, it has not been documented in every species, but it probably happens more than we think it does. Uh, it just hasn't been looked at in enough detail yet to really know that much about it. But we know it definitely does happen in some species. All right, so dragonflies are super territorial. Um, male dragonflies set up these territories at ponds and streams, whatever type of aquatic habitat they um, their babies live in, they'll set up territories and they basically protect this patch of water. Female dragonflies tend to choose a mate based on where they want to lay their eggs. So the male that holds the best places to lay eggs get the most um, mating opportunities. And so they fight it out for these, these spaces. Uh, and if you're the best male, you have definitely the best opportunity to reproduce. So for perchers, you have um, you have the situation where the, the males are kind of just looking out over their territory. And if another male flies in, um, they'll chase it out. Uh, and then they also will fly out and meet any female that is in that space. For the flyers, they've got a place that they're kind of a path they're flying through their territory and they're doing the same thing. They'll, um, they'll chase out other males and grab any females that come in. So as far as um, these competitions between males, you know, if you are a weaker male, you're not gonna mate as much as a stronger male. And so there's a lot of fights for the best places in these territories, and the best territories. Uh, and so you get a lot of these kind of threat displays where you have a male that's challenging another male that has a territory that he wants. Uh, and so this is a terrible picture. Um, but the one on the right is um, trying to convince the one on the left to leave. Um, and so they'll hover in front of them. They do different things depending on the species, but a lot of times they'll kind of hover in front. The one that's perched will get up and actually fly out. They'll usually kind of look at each other. And a lot of times they'll start flying around in this kind of swirling pattern. And then a lot of times take up, take off into the air. Basically they're chasing each other and whichever one chases the other one away gets the territory. And so um, you'll have that male come back. Um, a lot of times the same male will keep a hold of the territory, but it's a lot of energy that you have to expend to be chasing other males out of your space. So eventually, you know, they get weaker and weaker as they age and another male will eventually displace them. Um, but, you know, you'll see these kinds of behaviors all the time at ponds and streams when you see um, dragonflies interacting with each other. All right, so we're gonna talk about reproduction here. Um, dragonflies have so many weird anatomical things going on. And one of the weird things is they have two sets of genitalia at their males. And so um, most insects have um, their sperm release organs at the back end of their body. But in dragonflies, they use the back end of their body in a different way, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so they actually have to move sperm from the back to the front of their body. And so they've got a second set of genitalia that's like on their um, the bottom of their abdomen, close to the thorax. So that's what you see here. This male is actually like moving this end of his abdomen up here to move sperm from the back to the front so that he's ready to mate with a female. So once they've done that, the male will grab the female with the um, the um, they're called paraprox, uh, these little structures on the back. It's basically a little clap, a clamp that it will um, grab the back of the female's head. So if you are a dragonfly and your, your sperm is released back here and then you're grabbing the female's head, you know, that doesn't work so well. Uh, and so they've, they've moved sperm up here and then they grab the female by the back of the head. And they'll usually fly around together attached like that um, in a what's called a tandem flight. And so these dragonflies have sat down, um, but a lot of times you'll see them kind of flying together, male in the front, female in the back, and they'll fly for a few moments before they actually mate. So they mate in this weird crazy position that's called the wheel position. In damselflies, it's shaped kind of like a heart, uh, and in dragonflies, it's a little bit more round. Um, but basically, the female's reaching her 
um, reproductive organs up to meet that secondary set of genitalia in the male. And so this is where you actually get sperm transfer from the male to the female. And so you've got this weird, crazy way they fly. Um, damselflies tend to sit uh, when they're in this position. Dragonflies can fly um, or sit depending on the species. And it varies a little bit according to the day and kind of what they're, what they're doing. Um, but sometimes you'll see this whole process take place in flight as well. All right, so one other thing that dragonflies do is, um, here you can see the the, um, the secondary genitalia here. So this is that section where the, the males have transferring sperm to you. So these have all kinds of weird, crazy scoops, and they're actually scooping out all the sperm from um, previous matings out of the female before they deposit their own. Uh, and so they have these weird, crazy things that they do where they're they're actually like scooping sperm out. Some dragonflies will actually fling the female, like use centripetal force and like fling her over a few times and they'll just like combine out of her body. Um, there's some weird, crazy things happening with this, um, but they basically remove all the sperm from any previous meeting and then they put their own in uh, and they, um, a lot of times, if it's really hard to tell two species apart, they'll actually use genitalia because there's a very specific lock and key mechanism for this system for a, an individual species, uh, and it's it's really pretty cool. All right, once a female has mated, she's ready to start laying eggs, uh, and they do this a variety of different ways. This female has her abdomen just kind of in this... Um, little piece of cattail in the water. It's a little bit hard to see where the water actually is um, covering it here. But most dragonflies are gonna lay their eggs in the water somehow. Some of them will stick them on a rock. Some of them will stick them onto plants. Some of them will just kind of spray them anywhere that they happen to go in the water. Um, and they do these various different ways. Some dragonflies and damselflies will kind of sit in one place and just lay all their eggs, particularly if they're attaching them to something, they'll do this. Uh, but other dragonflies will kind of hover over the water and they'll just tap their abdomen. And so you'll see it flying around and then tap um, multiple times on the water. Basically, every time the um, female's abdomen hits the water, she's spraying eggs into the water and then they'll just fall down to the bottom. Uh, and so you'll see her hovering and tap, 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 tap. Uh, so it's kind of two different ways, you know, either sitting down and, and releasing eggs or flying and kind of bumping the water with your abdomen to release eggs. So because males are scooping out sperm from previous, previous um, matings, the male that has just reproduced with this female really, really wants her to lay her eggs before another male gets her. So you have a lot of what's called mate guarding where a male will protect the female that he's just mated with so that other males can't grab her. So these are uh, green darners. Um, the green darners, the male tends to keep a hold of the, the female. So if his little um, hair procs here are grabbing the back of her head, another male can't grab a hold of this female and take her um, and mate with her. So he's just holding on to her while she lays her eggs. So as soon as she's done laying her eggs, he'll let go and she'll fly away and that's that. Um, there are other species that don't hold on to the, the females though. Um, so for example, the black saddlebags that we have here in North Carolina, the male will hold on to the female and they'll kind of fly down towards the water. He'll let go of her and she'll tap her abdomen on the water and then he'll grab her again. And so it kind of almost looks like he's throwing her into the water. And then you have others like our pond hawks and our blue dashers where the male will just fly around the top of the female as she's laying her eggs. So she'll be tapping the abdomen with her eggs and the male's just flying around and he'll chase off any other male that comes along. Uh, so there's a lot of intense pressure on female to mate when they're near water. They actually spend most of their time away from water because this is actually pretty stressful. Um, there's tons of males that want to grab you and meet with you and they want to just like lay their eggs and be gone as fast as possible. Um, so one thing that was discovered just a few years ago, um, this is the um, common hawker. It's a very northern species, like an arctic, um, like subarctic species that we do not have here. Um, but a researcher discovered that females that are getting overly harassed in this species will actually play dead so that she'll be flying around and she'll just like stop flying and fall to the ground and pretend she's dead so that all the males will leave her alone and then she'll fly away. 
Um, so if they're getting really, really, really harassed, they can do this kind of thing where they're just like, oh, I'm dead. And um, then do their own thing once the males leave them alone. So this is a really cool behavior that was just discovered a few years ago. Um, this might happen in other species as well, but it's definitely known from this one species. Uh, and I think it's gonna be really interesting to see if there are more that do this behavior because it's really fascinating. All right, so I wanna talk about nymphs a little bit. Um, I told you I'd come back to these gills that these damselfly nymphs have. So they do a bunch of different things to try to get as much oxygen in contact with those gills as possible. Um, so these guys will do these little push-ups sometimes where they're kind of shaking their body. And that's basically stirring the water around their gills so that they're getting um, oxygen-rich water into contact with them um, and pushing the oxygen-depleted oxygen water away. They'll also wave their tails back and forth. So they're basically just stirring up the water to get as much oxygen into those gills as they can. Then for our dragonflies, I told you we have these um, rectal gill chambers that are inside that they're sucking water into their back ends to, um, to ventilate those gills. Um, they can also use that to their advantage. So if something wants to eat one of these dragonfly nymphs, they can squeeze the water out of that gill chamber and it shoots them forward really fast. And this is called jetting or, or jet propulsion um, because they're basically like pushing against the water and um, by shoving that water out their back end and they can scoot forward really, really, really fast and get away from a predator. And they'll actually kind of swim like this. They'll suck some more water in and then keep doing that. So um, when dragonflies swim, they're actually usually, usually using that gill chamber rather than their legs. They don't swim very well with their legs. Um, so they are mostly using that, that gill chamber to, to swim. Um, damselflies flip their tail kind of like a fish to swim. Um, so completely different systems, um, but both really pretty cool. All right, then Dragonfly nymphs have to molt a whole bunch of times. So you probably all know that insects are very limited in their size based on how big their exoskeleton is. So they, they molt and then they grow and then they are too big to be able to fit in their exoskeleton anymore. So they'll molt again. Uh, dragonflies do that and damselflies a lot of times compared to most other insects. So most immature insects have somewhere between like three and six or seven molts before they turn into adults. Um, dragonflies can be up to like 40 or 50 times that they, they molt because their eggs are tiny, 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 and their nymphs are really big before they, um, they turn into adults. So they have to molt a whole lot of times. Um, and when they do that, they're, molt, they're shedding every bit of their exoskeleton. And their exoskeleton lines their entire digestive system, their entire... Um, developing reproductive system and their entire um, respiratory system. So actually what you see here, these little white threads, that's that respiratory system actually getting pulled out of the inside of the new respiratory system. Um, so they're, they're pulling out a big chunk of their, their, um, their bodies out of these, these exoskeletons here. And you can see kind of the leftover bits of um, the, the respiratory system and that um, digestive system inside. All right, so dragonflies are cold-blooded, they're um, ectothermic, so they um, are mostly about the same temperature as the, the air, uh, and that's not always the world's best thing if you are an insect. Um, on really hot days or really cold days, uh, that really messes with your system. So dragonflies thermally or behaviorally thermoregulate, so they are using behaviors to help them kind of regulate their temperatures so one thing they do is this behavior, which is called obelisking. This is meant to reduce the amount of contact that the sun has with their body. So they point that abdomen directly at the sun and so that there's a few um, sun rays hitting their bodies as possible. And you'll see this all the time. They might also flip their abdomen down, um, but they're basically just reducing the surface area that the sun is hitting uh, to help cool them down. Now this only gets you so far. If it's really, really, really hot, being out in the sun is not that great for you. You know, we all start seeking shade if it's really hot uh, and they do the same thing. So this is um, actually the pond where I worked and they are mostly flying out kind of over these open areas, you know, in full sun most of the time, 
But when it's a day like the last few days where it's, you know, getting up close to 100 degrees and super humid and very hot, um, they're going to start seeking shade. And so even some of those flying species might stop flying. Um, they'll find a nice shady spot where they can just hang onto a tree, hang out for a little while and um, cool their bodies down a little bit and then go back to what they were doing. Now, of course, if you're a male and you had a really good territory, you don't want to leave your territory for longer than you have to. So it's a pretty big deal for you to stop moving and leave your space. Um, but sometimes this becomes necessary. And then on the other end of the spectrum, which, you know, has not happened recently, um, if they are too cold, they can't fly. And these are very flight driven animals. So early in the year, when it's still really chilly in the morning, a lot of times they will um, shiver, they'll kind of flutter their wings. Uh, and so they're moving them just a tiny little bit, but that kind of warms up their wing muscles enough that they're able to start flying at a, a little bit of a lower temperature than they can um, normally fly. So they're, they're using their, their behaviors to kind of warm up their bodies a little bit. Okay, I have just a few more that I wanna share. And then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so at night, even the flyers are gonna sit. Um, so they're finding roosts. Uh, and depending on the species, the amount of time they spend roosting uh, at night varies. Uh, most of the time they're doing this kind of on their own. They're not in big groups. Um, sometimes if they're migrating, they'll end up in big groups just because there's so many dragonflies moving at one time that they're all kind of congregated together. But most of the time they're just kind of off in a, um, you know, a tree or a plant, somewhere kind of protected. Uh, different species are either kind of hanging vertically on a plant or horizontally. Uh, it varies a lot according to species. So this is a green darner. It was, um, sheltering under a big leaf magnolia tree um, at the eco station, um, blew in at about 6.30 or 7 p.m. Um, and then was probably hanging out there until about daylight the next day. So they do have a period of rest where they're kind of in these protected roost areas um, where they can just kind of relax for a bit and stop flying if you're a species like this one that flies all the time. This is a behavior that I think is amazing. Uh, it's called pond abandonment. Um, and we don't know exactly how it works, but for the most part, when a storm blows in, all the dragonflies leave a pond. Uh, and there's kind of two different reasons why this might happen. One is they could sense that there's a storm coming and they're leaving so that they're not risking getting knocked into the water. If you're a dragonfly getting knocked in the water is a little bit tricky for you because you've got those giant wings that are um, really hard to get back out of the water. They get trapped in the surface film. Uh, and so they could be leaving to protect themselves from that. But another explanation is these animals are very light driven. Uh, and actually um, I've done work showing that light intensity is the most kind of important thing for this behavior. Uh, if the light levels drop, like right before a storm comes in, uh, they might be seeking roosts um, and thinking that it's, it's getting to be nighttime and going to find a roost. Uh, and then when the sun comes back out, they'll come right back out. Um, but it's uncertain whether they're just doing their kind of normal nighttime thing because the light levels have dropped or because they're actually sensing a storm. Uh, they're not using barometric pressure at all to tell them that anything's coming in. Um, and so... Um, there's kind of two, two different explanations, but it's a really cool thing to watch. If you ever have a chance to kind of sit by a pond right before a storm, you'll definitely see all this activity. Like they actually boost their activity a lot right before a storm comes in and then they'll, they'll all leave, which is pretty cool. All right, and then the very last one I wanna talk about is one that people ask about a lot. Um, this time of year, you see dragonflies flying around cars a lot in this area. And it's typically this kind of yellowy colored dragonfly. It might be a little bit more brown. Um, the two gliders that we have, this is the wandering glider. So this is that one that um, flies across oceans and migrates from India to Africa and is located in North Carolina as well. This one's found on every continent except Antarctica because it's gotten there itself. Uh, but this one also is a specialist on small temporary bodies of water. Their nymph stage is really fast compared to most other dragonflies. So it's just a matter of a few weeks rather than like a whole year or multiple years like a lot of dragonflies. Uh, and so they're looking for little puddles. And unfortunately, our cars give off the same polarized light 
pattern as um, little puddles do. Um, at least certain clear coats and certain color combinations and clear coats give off that same light pattern. So when they're flying around looking for a body of water to lay their eggs in, they can't tell our cars apart from a puddle. And so they're using your car, they're, like they're patrolling your car thinking that it is a puddle that they're gonna um, mate and lay eggs in. Uh, and so they're, they're really mixed up and um, definitely not going to reproduce effectively on the hood of your car. Um, but that's that's why you're seeing that. Um, so you'll see these in parking lots. You'll see them at stoplights. You know, there's lots of these out right now. And so that if you haven't seen one yet this year, it'll it'll probably happen soon. All right. I flew through so much information very quickly. Um, what questions do people have? I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Lifespan. Um, it depends a lot on where they're located. So um, species that are found in both the North and the South can take a lot longer in the Northern part of their range than the Southern part, just because the water is colder. Uh, and so, you know, again, they're, oops, sorry, I forgot to, um, the question was what the lifespan is uh, for those of you on Zoom. Um, so something like a green darner might take three years to develop in Canada and only a year here. Uh, so it depends a lot. Um, but most of them are about a year in the water and then on land for between three to five weeks as adults. So most of their life is actually spent as immatures um, and very, very little of it is spent as adults. Mostly the adult stage exists to make more immatures. Okay, anybody in the room, raise your hand and then in the meantime, David, you want to read one question from the audience on Zoom? Sure. Our first question from the Zoom audience. Um, are there characteristics that distinguish between male and female dragonflies, such as colors, shapes, or et cetera? Yes, yes. Uh, there are definitely characteristics to tell males and females apart. Um, so actually, I'm going to back up, pull in a bunch of slides here. Um, so the easiest thing to look for, there are many species that are sexually dimorphic. So the males and the females are different colors. And for those, just looking at the color is the easiest thing. Um, although those colors can change a little bit depending on how old they are. But for um, all dragonflies and flies, the males have this secondary set of genitalia. So if you see this kind of bump sticking off the front of the abdomen, you know you're looking at a male. And if you um, see a smooth space here instead of this kind of little knob sticking off, uh, you're looking at a female. And that is the the most certain way to know that you're looking at a male versus a female. Great, thank you. So um, these ones that come to your pond, is it um, both male and female or do the females like test to make sure that it's wet before they start <laughs> hanging around? It's um, so the question is about um, the ones that use your cars um, and whether the it's both males and females and whether they're testing. So it's mostly males patrolling the cars because they are you know patrolling or making that territory theirs, uh, and then the female will fly in. It does not appear that they actually notice that there is a difference between the hood of a car and water um, because they will definitely lay eggs on cars, um, and so it does not seem like they can distinguish that. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I've seen, going around ponds, I see wings from dragonflies. And is that other dragonflies eating them or is it probably a bird? All right, the question is about when you find just wings by themselves, um, whether they're um, other dragonflies or birds. Uh, it can be both. Um, so bigger dragonflies will definitely eat smaller dragonflies and they'll rip the wings off and leave those. Um, but there are lots of birds that hunt at ponds um, and along streams as well that will also frequently leave the wings behind. The wings are definitely not digestible by really anything except other insects that eat those kinds of things. So um, no one cares about wings. Um, so a lot of times they'll just pull those off because then you've immobilized your insect um, and you take it and eat it. Um, or, uh, just leaving them behind because they're worthless nutritionally. Okay, we'll take one more from our intern audience. I'll hand it back to David. Yeah. Well, question more for you, I guess, than anything else. Uh, I watched this really good uh, special on TV about quantum biology. I don't know if you have familiar with it, but 
but they're showing that there's uh, applications to animal behavior, like uh, there are certain animals that behave according to magnetism and the, the poles of the earth. And there's nothing in their system that's complicated enough that would tell them those things. So they figure it's the photons changing like at the molecular level, like things that they do based on the molecular bond level. And I'm wondering if, I'm just wondering, and it's very interesting to see all these odd dragonfly behaviors like the ponding, the pond abandonment, stuff like that. Maybe at some point, they're saying this is a new thing that's come in over the years. This quantum biology could explain a lot of these unexplainable, like it's impossible. How does this thing know to do this? It can't have the technology in its body to do it. I just thought it was very interesting. And that you brought that up to kind of reminded me of that. But, yeah, that's cool. Um, I do not know much about quantum biology. Um, I, I am not great at physics. Um, so <laughs> that, that level of detail is not my thing. I really, I'm good at watching things do behaviors and figuring that out. But um, yeah, it would be, I would be surprised if there's not something like that going on with um, some of these behaviors, particularly like the cues they're using to migrate that could be light, it could be a temperature, it could be um, like they, they usually travel when winds are moving a certain way. So there's all kinds of different things that they're sensing um, and they're clearly sensing their environment to at least give them the cue that they need to start moving. But then, you know, with these dragonflies, like we don't know exactly where they go and they migrate, how they figure out how to get there in the first place. Um, so there's still so many unanswered questions and that definitely could be playing a role. All right, so um, I have a couple from Zoom. Uh, first is, are there any animals that are predators to both dragonflies and damselflies? Yes, um, bigger dragonflies can eat both. So if you have something like a green darner, a comet darner at a pond, they might eat um, pond hawks and uh, white tails and they'll eat damselflies. And there are lots and lots of birds that will eat both as well. Um, there are fish that'll eat both. Um, there's some great videos you can see a fish like jumping out of, water and um, grabbing dragonflies and damselflies. Um, I just want to share that I did see once one of the most amazing things I saw was trying to photograph a dragonfly at an insect photography workshop that I went to. And this alligator jumped entirely out of the water, little one. It was only like two and a half feet long, but jumped entirely out of the water and grabbed this dragonfly I was trying to take a picture of. And I was so shocked that I didn't get a picture of the, the alligator, which would have been amazing. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of things that definitely want to eat these. They're big, meaty animals that have a lot of protein and they're really, really valuable as food for a lot of things. Okay, we have a question. So I don't see eyelids on the right. So how do they cope with the sun and the, and the moving their head around all the time? The sun will be coming in all the, all the various angles. Oh, that's a good question. Um, how they cope with the sun since they don't have eyel eyelids. Um, that is not something I'm able to answer, unfortunately. Um, their eyes are really tricky. We don't know as much about how insect eyes work as we could. Um, they're so different than ours because, you know, they've got those compound eyes. So they've got all those little facets um, and we don't even really know whether they're seeing all those facets simultaneously or they're processing all of that into a single image. Um, they're definitely very sensitive to light changes. So, um, you know, getting dark before a storm or just, you know, predators passing over like a, a prey bird, a predator bird, um, you know, will make them change their behavior. So we definitely know that they're sensing light and dark. Um, but we don't know if these guys really see colors that much or like how they see. So it's, it's a little nebulous in the first place, but I'm not as up to date on my knowledge of how their vision works, unfortunately. All right, and two from Zoom, uh, kind of related. Um, one participant lives about um, a quarter mile to a half a mile away from a lake. So she's wondering if um, most of the dragonflies would be female in her yard. And then another question uh, related to that is how can you attract dragonflies and damselflies to your yard? All right. Um, so probably mostly females if you're a little bit further away from the water, although a body of water can only hold so many males. And so um, at that point, those males are going out and foraging in the same places the females are. So like I live about a quarter of a mile from a small pond that has some dragonflies and most of the ones I get in my yard are females, but we do get males occasionally. So yeah, all those weaker males or older males that are no longer able to hold a territory are kind of out where the females are. 
Um, as far as attracting dragonflies to a garden, um, unfortunately, if you want dragonflies, you have to have prey animals. Uh, and so um, you've got to have a lot of other insects. And if you're not willing to have things like mosquitoes and other <laughs> insects in your yard, um, you're probably never going to get dragonflies. Um, a lot of people will build ponds for dragonflies. And the trick with that is you can't actually clean them out too frequently. I mean, keep the, like, keep the water moving so that you can keep your mosquito population down. Um, but these dragonflies need to be in there for a long time to be able to actually turn into adults. Um, so if you want dragonflies reproducing in a body of water, you can't flush them out and clean them every you know, month or six months or whatever. You need that to be there for like a whole year or more. Um, the good thing about that is that these animals are so efficient as predators that for the most part, once you've got your system going and it's working well, you know, these animals will take care of a lot of those other little insects in a, a pond. Um, but you really have to have other little prey insects to have dragonflies in your yard. There's a lot of times people want to attract them to get rid of mosquitoes in their yard, but you have the dragonflies because the mosquitoes are there. Um, so you got to give them something else to get to keep them there. Um, and figuring out how to do that without getting mosquitoes there is always tricky. <laughs> okay, any other questions in the room? All right. Oh, you have a question? What's the common life cycle of an adult salt dragonfly and a nymph dragonfly combined? Can you repeat that, please? What's the life cycle? of an adult dragonfly and a nymph dragonfly combined? Like like the whole the whole lifespan? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're asking about the, the entire lifespan. Um, depends on where they are and which species it is. Most of them are about a year entirely from when they're laid to the end of their life um, with the last few weeks of that being the adult. But it can be three, five years also if it, they're in a colder place and a bigger, a bigger species. What are your citizen science projects for, with dragonflies? Yeah, okay, so the two citizen science projects I run, one is um, mostly done with the data collection, so I'm working on writing it up right now. It's called um, Dragonfly Detectives. And so we had kids looking at actually how weather influences dragonfly behaviors. Um, that's my my big pet project. I love that topic for whatever reason. Um, so I, I did as an undergrad for my senior thesis, and uh, we were looking at um, common white tails and how they responded to little micro changes in weather. So we had the kids, um, measuring weather characteristics every five minutes and counting dragonfly flights that they saw um, and learned that um, dragonflies really like the same kind of weather we do. Um, they want it to be sunny, kind of light breeze, low humidity in this part of the country um, and not too terribly hot. Um, so basically they like a perfect summer day, just like we do. Uh, and they really dislike really windy conditions, really humid conditions they're not so fond of um, and very hot. Um, so had something like 450 kids help us collect data for that one. And then the other one's looking at the swarming behavior. So it's called the Dragonfly Swarm Project. If any of you see a swarm, if you look up Dragonfly Swarm Project online, you'll end up in the right place. Um, I've been collecting data on this one for 12 years now. Um, we're trying to figure out kind of where these swarms are happening in the first place and kind of how they're starting to form. So I think that these swarms are really, really important for kind of maintaining the balance of prey populations. Um, so you'll see them a lot after big disturbances. So hurricanes, floods, uh, fires, anytime you get other insect populations really out of whack and you get a really big increase in like mosquitoes after a flood um, condition, you get all these dragonflies that come in and kind of take care of all those things. And they're also, you know, feeding on all those kind of late summer, fall um, insect population booms as they're migrating. Um, so I just have people basically tell me a story about what they saw when they see one of these. It's just a simple Google form um, and uh, hoping to publish that data set as soon as I actually have time to sit down and write it. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's wonderful to have you here as always. We are working toward, we're in conversation with Chris about maybe doing a workshop next summer. So stay tuned for that. And uh, again, please join me in thanking Chris for being here today. Thank you so much.
thank you all for coming. have a great rest of your day. enjoy the garden.